Amen. So like I said, it's good to be with you this morning. And I'm going to be sharing a word that the Holy Spirit gave me on Monday as I was praying and seeking God. You know, he laid this uh, word in my heart. And I encourage you to receive everything that God has for you. God always speaks to us. And I share this while we were praying and fasting on Friday and then on Sunday when we met in the church in Paul and that God is a God who speaks. So the most important thing after a person receives salvation is the baptism of the Holy Spirit because that's where God empowers you to live a holy life. That's not what I say. That's what Jesus said. Listen to what he said in Acts chapter 1. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of my Father, which you heard me say. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that was on the day of Pentecost when they all got filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And I encourage you, if God has baptized you already with the Holy Spirit, to speak in tongues every single day. Number one, it makes you sensitive to the Holy Spirit so that you can pick up the mind of God. And like I was sharing with my brother Wayne yesterday, you know, I pray in tongues at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes a day just to get the mind of God to see what God is saying. It's an important tool that God has given the body of Christ, which many Christians don't use. They probably spoke in tongues when they first got filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they stopped. That's something that we have to constantly do every single day so that we can be able to hear from God. So as I was praying on Monday, he gave me this word, and the, the word is how to run the race with perseverance, taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 3. How to run the race with perseverance, because at this time, I believe many are feeling fatigued and tired and just weary with all the problems, maybe personally, maybe problems with your marriage, maybe problems with your, your kids, maybe problems at work with everything that's going on. And Satan has a way of wearing people down. Satan has a way of, of constantly an onslaught over and over and over again that at times Christians feel tired and they feel like giving up. So in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, we're going to go over that. How to run the race with perseverance. So just to give you a broader context of the book of Hebrews, because we always have to interpret the scriptures in context. So Hebrews was written to Christian Jews who were serving God faithfully, who were walking with God, but they were receiving a lot of persecution from their Jewish friends and family members. At that time, if you confessed that Jesus was Christ and became a Christian, you will be put out of the synagogue, which was the place of instruction. It was the place where they socialized. Their families grew up together. So now they're receiving a lot of persecution from their Jewish friends and family members. And now they're thinking about abandoning their faith. It's just becoming too hard now to be a Christian. So the whole theme of Hebrews is encouraging these Christians not to turn back, to hold on. And I just want to read to you some scriptures from the book of Hebrews, like I said, to give you a broader context so you can see that the thrust of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Obviously, some of them were already drifting away. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house. If we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. He's telling them, keep your courage and keep your confidence in Christ. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day, whether it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us Hold firmly to what we have believed. In other words, don't let go. Hold that firmly. And then Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, and this is something that we quote all the time. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another 
And all the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 and 36. Now he tells them, remember how far you've come. Remember, the Christian life is, is a marathon, not a sprint. Remember how far, how far you've run already. And listen to what he tells them. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all, when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew that there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that God has promised. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. And sometimes we have to be reminded like where we have come, how far the Lord has taken us. And say, sometimes Satan causes us to forget how far we've run already, you know, what God has done in our lives. For those who've been saved, you know, two, three years, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 30, 40, remember how far we've come. And then Hebrews chapter 13, verse two, he tells them, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. And then Hebrews chapter 11, this is called the Faith Hall of Fame. He tells them to look to people who already have crossed the finish line. I'm not going to read the whole Hebrews chapter 11, but he mentions people like Abel, who by faith served God, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. So that's Hebrews chapter 11, and now we go to Hebrews chapter 12, which is going to be our main text. So to give you just an overview of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, I mean chapter 12, verse 1, therefore, that word therefore means because of this, because of everything I have told you, because of all these different people that have run the race before us, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what cloud of witnesses? Abel, Abraham, Moses, he's telling we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, people that already have finished the faith, and we have a greater cloud of witnesses. Remember, at that time, the whole New Testament was not written. So the writer of Hebrews was encouraging the Jewish Christians, look at the people that have gone before you, their testimony, they held on. We are surrounded by such a greater cloud of witnesses. And like I said, we have a greater cloud of witnesses because we have 2,000 years of Christian history, people that have gone before us that have gone through some of the things we're going through. You know, we're not alone. We have all this cloud of witnesses that we can look to, you know, that, that cheers us on. So the first thing we need to do to run this race, we can run the race by looking at others who have crossed the finish line. By looking at others who have crossed the finish line. And not only the Old Testament saints, but Matthew, Luke, the Apostle Paul, Peter, you know, and, and Silas, uh, Barnabas, and all these other apostles and, and other Christians that have crossed the finish line already. That's why whenever you're discouraged, read, you know, the, the scriptures, especially a biography. Or if you want to read other books on biographies of men and women of God that have crossed the finish line already, that can encourage you and say, you know what, you're going to make it too, you know. And sometimes you read their stories and they had greater opposition than we do, you know, and they went through greater testings than we did. So they're there to encourage us, not for us to idolize them and worship them, but to see them as examples of those who crossed the finish line. And I encourage you after this, read the whole uh, chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, because then he goes into this. The second point, he says, we can run the race by laying aside every distraction. So now we have all these cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, everything that hinders, laying aside every distraction. Now that word hinder in the Greek means excess weight and bulk of body. 
All serious athletes train and strain to remove all excess weight. Things that hold us back, such as use of time, some forms of entertainment, or certain relationships. This refers to things that may be legitimate and innocent and in themselves, but they hinder the Christian runner. They hamper and slow him down instead of helping him run faster. So this is not talking about blatant sin. We're going to get to that next. This is talking about any weight that, so, that hinders you, any thing that's in the way, anything that's impeding you from running this race. And it might be good things. Sometimes hobbies become a distraction. It hinders us. Sometimes, unfortunately, it might be your spouse. You know, I encourage you to pray for them. But anything that is hindering you, anything that is weighing you down, that you know that you've been spending too much time with that hobby or you're wasting too much time watching TV and is hindering your walk with God, you need to lay that aside. You can't run the race when you're carrying heavy burdens. You need to give that up to God. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. So anything that is burdening you and that is weighing you down, and a lot of times it's not necessarily sin is good things that we have allowed to take over our lives. We have allowed to consume us, e even good things, you know, that, that may be innocent, but it's still a distraction. For some people, it might be a relationship that has become a distraction. Some people, it might be their favorite show, you know, they've been watching, you know, and if it's on, you know, they, they watch it constantly and they don't take time to read the word and to pray. Anything that's weighing you down, and that's why it's important to live a life of prayer. You know, you could be weighed down because of your marriage or because you have an uh, unsaved uh, son or daughter or the things that are going on in this world and you just feel heavy burden and weighed down. You need to give that unto the Lord so that you can run with perseverance. It's hard to run with a lot of heavy baggage on you spiritually. You need to throw that aside and you need to pray. If you know right now, say, Lord, Help me remove these hindrances, even though they might be good things. You might be overly involved in certain things, and it can even be ministry at times. There's some people that are involved in every single ministry, and they don't take time to spend with the Lord and in prayer. So even ministry can be a heavy burden if we're not spending quality time with God. And now ministry becomes a, a, a burden. It becomes a, an obligation. And you know, it shouldn't be that way. So anything that is impeding your walk with God, you need to remove it so that you can run the race with perseverance. The next thing, the third thing, how can we run the race? By laying aside the sin that entangles. Now, this is talking about sin, disobedience toward God. In other words, you read the Bible and it says to do one thing and you do another. That's sin. The Christian runner must strip off the sin which so easily trips or entangles him. It is the picture of the clothing flapping around a person while he is trying to run. And at that time, the Greek athletes used to run, you know, naked because, you know, it, it didn't hinder them from running. So here, flapping around with all these clothes and burdens and all that, it entangles and trips him and he falls. Sins such as greed, pride, arrogance, lust, gossip, dishonesty, stealing can cause believers to drift off spiritual course. So any sin that entangles you, and, and notice how it says it easily entangles you, and you can't run when you're entangled by sin. When, when you have all these things around you, it's hard to run the race with perseverance. You need to lay that aside if you're going to run the race that God has marked out for us, no matter what sin it is. And sometimes when I mention the word sin, people think about the external sins, like murder, you know, adultery, sins that we can see that are obvious, somebody getting high on cocaine. Wow, that's terrible. But we need to watch out the sins of the heart. And that's why every Christian needs to walk in the spirit of forgiveness, a spirit of forgiveness. Unforgiveness would hinder your walk with God. Unforgiveness will entangle you in a web that keeps you from running the race with perseverance. So we always got to examine our hearts and not judge ourselves based upon what everybody else is doing. Unbelief could be a sin that can be hindering us. Jealousy because of somebody's ministry or God is using them more, or you, you like the way that person prophesies or their prayer life or the way, the way they bring forth the word or the way God is, whatever the case may be, jealousy can creep in a person's heart and that's a sin in the eyes of God. So these are things that hinder us from running the race 
with perseverance, it entangles us. You can't run when you're constantly entangled by sin, you know, because then condemnation comes in, you feel guilty, you don't want to pray, you don't want to read the Bible, you know, it's distracting. So any sin that is in your heart, pray and ask God to forgive you and move on. Those are the worst sins in the world, the sins of the heart. No one can see, but God's word highlights it like a flashlight and he sees everything. So we constantly got to guard our hearts and always compare ourselves with Christ, not with one another. That's why Paul told the Corinthians, you guys comparing yourselves among yourselves is not wise. Don't compare yourself with other believers because you'll always find somebody that makes you feel good so that you can say, well, I'm not as that other person. Always compare yourself to Christ and you'll always live on your knees. Have mercy upon me, Lord, a sinner. God, how am I displeasing you? Show me, Lord, if there's anything impeding my walk with you. Show me if there's any unforgiveness in my heart. Show me, Lord, if I was rude to that person. Show me, Lord, if there's anything, Lord, that, that is distracting me. Compare yourself with Christ and you will always live a lifestyle of prayer because we will never be like Christ on this earth, but that gives us a goal to pursue Christ and say, Lord, I want to be more like you every single day. The people that don't pray are the people that in their hearts think that they already reached perfection, you know, because when you know your need of Christ, you're constantly on your knees asking him to help you. You never get enough of Christ because he's the only one that can really change our hearts and examine us. So when people don't pray, it's almost like an attitude of pride. I can do it on my own. I have enough intellect. I have enough college degree. I have enough wisdom that I can handle things on my own. I don't need you, God. And they use God as a parachute only in extreme emergencies. That's a bad attitude to have. We should always need Christ every single day and live in humility and brokenness. So lay aside every sin that entangles us and let us run with perseverance. That's the uh, fourth point. We can run the race by developing stamina through prayer and the word of God, by developing stamina through prayer and the word of God. Let us run the race with what? Perseverance, the race marked out for us. So developing stamina. So how do you develop spiritual stamina? By praying, seeking God, being in the word of God. And these Christian Jews were immature. You can read that in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, that they die, it was milk. The writer was saying, I want to give you a meat of the word, but you need to go back to the elementary principles of the word of God. You know, repentance, faith toward God, water baptisms. So they were immature believers because they were not constantly exposing themselves to the word of God. So that's how you develop stamina. Remember, the Christian life is a race, not a sprint. We need to last all the way until the end. We need to cross the finish line, but you're not going to develop stamina by watching five hours of TV, by socializing all the time and not taking time out to pray and spend time with God. Every time you spend time with God in prayer and in the word, you're receiving strength from heaven. How many know that we need divine strength for this Christian life? That's why God said, I have not left you alone, but I have given you another comforter that he may be with you forever. Why do Christians fall? Very simple. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why do Christians fall? They don't watch and they don't pray. So when temptation comes, they're going to fall into it. Temptation is always going to be there. But Jesus said, if you watch and pray, you're going to be receiving spiritual strength so that when temptation does come, you have the spiritual stamina to resist that temptation because in ourselves, we are weak. How many know that the flesh is weak? It falls into temptation easily. That's why you have somebody that's not a Christian that starts smoking cigarettes. Before you know it, they're smoking weed. And before you know it, they're smoking crack. And before you know it, they go down. The flesh is weak. It easily falls into temptation. And one of the things I can tell you by being strong is knowing what you're weak in. Being strong is knowing where you're weak in and depend upon God in that. So we need to develop that stamina. How many have seen believers that start off running real hard? 
They love the Lord. They're in the word. They're in prayer. We call a fast. They're there. You know, they, they love the Lord, but they never took time to develop that personal relationship with God. They didn't take time to pray and to be in the word of God. When temptation or persecution comes, they fall away because they didn't have the stamina to keep them going on. Remember, we need perseverance. We need endurance, but only the word of God imparts that endurance. Prayer imparts that endurance, especially praying in unknown tongues. Look, listen to what Paul the Apostle said, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He who speaks in tongues edifies himself. That word edify means to build yourself up. He who prays in tongues, you building your spirit man up. You're building that stamina. So when temptation comes, you can tell the devil in his face, get away from me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. You have that spiritual strength. And that's why Paul the apostle was so powerful. 1 Corinthians 14, 18, he says this, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words intelligibly to edify others. So in a public assembly, Paul said, I'd rather speak in my known language so that others may be edified. But in my own private time, I speak in tongues more than all of you Corinthians, building himself up, stirring himself up, the gift of God operating through him, receiving strength from God. So we need stamina in this day and age. So if you're here, listen to me this morning and you have been feeling fatigued and weary and you feel that Satan is wearing you down with, constantly, you know, because Satan is not the type that he throws an attack here. And then if you uh, are beaten down, he says, you know what, leave him alone. We'll come back tomorrow. The onslaughts of the enemy continue to come over and over and over again from all sides at times. That if you're not plugged in to that spiritual charger, which is the Holy Spirit, every single day, you're not going to have the stamina to run the race with endurance. Very important, church. And number five, we can run the race by looking at Jesus who stands at the finish line. Verse 2 says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Again, that word endurance, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, we look to Jesus who's the ultimate example of crossing the finish line. But how did he cross that finish line? It says that for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. In other words, for us to look at Jesus, not so much just at, at him, but at his work. How did he overcome the cross? Be the joy that was set before him, he was able to endure. In other words, we have to think about the end in mind. You know, we're gonna go to heaven. We're gonna be in the friends of God forever. Think about the end in mind. That causes you to endure. So Jesus endured because he saw the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. What was the joy that was set before him? That he was going to reconcile humanity back to God. That he was providing atonement and salvation for all humanity. That's what motivated him. And whenever he felt like giving up, he endured because of the joy that was set before him. He saw all the millions of Christians that were going to receive him into their hearts. All the millions of Christians that were going to be redeemed and that kept them motivated, not only looking to Jesus, but what he endured, despising the shame of the cross. Because the cross is a sign of, of, of suffering and shame. It's a criminal's death, but he was able to endure that looking at the millions of Christians that were going to be saved. And we need to look at Jesus and at the finish line. Don't compare your present sufferings with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Look at what we have in Christ. Look at how far you've come. Look at Christ that was able to endure. He had the end in mind saying, you know what? I'm going to die on that cross, but many, many sons and daughters are going to come to me and they're going to be reconciled to God. Think about the end in mind when you're being tempted or the onslaught of the devil is, is overwhelming you. Think about the end in mind and say, you know what? It's worth it at the end. There's others that have crossed the finish line. And number six, we can run the race by enduring opposition from people. Look at verse three. Consider him, or that him you can replace it with Christ. Consider Christ who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. Another translation says, give up. Look at Christ who endured opposition 
from sinful men. And you have to realize that, that sinful men is going to oppose the believer. You have to go with that in mind. And people that have a disease to please, they want everybody to be happy with them. They want everybody to agree with them and everything. Consider Christ. He endured opposition from sinful men. Everything he went through, you know, they even told him he was Belzebub, the prince of demons. You know, even his family said he's out of his mind. Go get him. He's in that house preaching. You know, he said, look, my mother and my father, those who do the will of God, you know. So he suffered a lot. Even his brothers did not believe in him. Judas betrayed him. He went through so much with sinful men, such opposition. And you have to realize that as a believer, we will be opposed all the way until the end by Satan and also by people that he uses to speak discouragement, to, to you know, speak negative things. It could be family members. Sometimes it could be a spouse. It could be your own children that keep reminding you of, of the past and what you've done. It could be people at work. Look, sinful people are never going to be in the same boat with us because, you know, they, they think different. It's two different worlds, the believers and the non-believers. And listen to what the Word of God says about non-believers. It says this, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The unbeliever will never understand spiritual things unless the Holy Spirit opens their minds and they receive Christ into their life, they remain blinded. They can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and that's why one of my uh, favorite preachers, Dr. Martin Lord joins when they ask him to publicly debate a non-believer. He always refused because he says, look, it's a futile exercise because the unbeliever would never understand the word of God or spiritual things. So for me to argue with somebody that's never going to understand because they're blinded by the devil is a waste of time. He felt you don't argue the word of God. You preach the word of God, you preach the love of God, you preach the gospel, you preach salvation, but he didn't feel right to sit there and argue with somebody that can never understand. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, nor can he know them because they are spiritually recognized. Only the believer, when I quote a scripture, it speaks to your heart and you can say amen. That's the word of God. Only the believer can understand spiritual things. The unbeliever doesn't understand anything. That's why we need to share the gospel with them. The only thing we should be sharing with them is the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can be, get saved and then everything makes sense to them. But if not, the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelievers so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And the veil remains in their mind and that veil is taken away in Christ. So have that in mind. You will receive opposition from people that are not saved and sometimes from people that are saved. But here... Uh, specifically is talking about sinful people. Everything that Christ went through with sinful people, you know, even the Pharisees rejected him and called them names. And they're the ones that instigated his crucifixion, you know, and, and Jesus looked at them in the eyes. And remember the Pharisees knew the whole Old Testament. Listen to this sermon, John chapter eight, verse 44. Jesus looks at the Pharisee and tells them, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to carry out. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. For he is a liar and the father of lies. How many want to invite Christ to preach in their church next Sunday? If Christ was here in many churches, he would not be allowed to preach. He's being too strong. He's got to be a little sensitive, you know, tone it down with the Pharisees. You know, they know the word. You are of your father, the devil, he told them. And the desires of your father you want to carry out. Strong preaching, but the truth is what sets people free. Of course, in love, the truth in love. So we can know the whole Bible like the Pharisees, but if we don't know Christ and have that relationship with Christ, everything doesn't mean anything. So we got to understand that we got to seek Christ and we will receive opposition. Because some people get saved and says, well, everything's going to be wonderful. God has a calling upon my life. I'm called a pastor. I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm called to prophesy. This is wonderful. Everybody's going to agree with me. Everybody's going to be excited about the call of God in my life. Everything should be smooth if God has called me. And the opposite is true. All hell breaks loose, not only on the outside, but even sometimes in your own home. All hell breaks loose. There's opposition from all sides. And Satan resists you all the way. 
And then you start thinking to yourself, well, maybe God didn't call me. Maybe God, you know, he missed it. You know, maybe I'm not the one he chose. You have to understand you will receive opposition. That's part of the Christian life. Opposition makes you stronger. Resistance makes you stronger. And it keeps you keeping on and running this race with perseverance. And I want to close with these words from the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. He says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. Now Paul died beheaded. They cut his head off in Rome. He says in verse 7, I have fought the good fight. Now listen to this, church. This should be our motto. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. May we, all of us who are listening to this right now, be able to say that at the end of our lives. And those who will be listening later on Facebook, because I encourage you to share this. That we'll all be able to say that I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So what you're fighting for every single day is your faith in God. Paul said, I kept the faith. Every single day, Satan attacks our minds, causing us to doubt the word of God, causing us to, to think that God is not real, that God has abandoned us in this time of trouble and everything that's going on, that God has forsaken us, that God does not love us constantly putting holes in our faith, that if we're not daily feeding ourselves with the living word of God, which imparts faith, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. If you're not daily feeding upon the word of God and Satan is attacking your mind with doubt and unbelief or know that your faith leaks out, and before you know it, you're going to be discouraged. You're going to feel like giving up. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren that accuses us day and night before God. He accuses us, you know, constantly. You're not reading your Bible. You're not a Christian. God doesn't love you. You know, why are you saying this? Look, you messed up so many times. You know, there's no hope for you. Why don't you just give up? Everybody knows what you're constantly accusing us. That accusing voice, you got to be able to recognize it and tell them there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. I have authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. We need to speak the word of God when that devil that accuses us in our minds, especially with things, things we have done already in the past. He loves bringing up the past because you can't change it. And some of us have, have sinned in the past, and we haven't really forgiving ourselves and we're still under condemnation and guilt and just beating down and that falls under laying aside every hindrance that weigh, uh, weighing you down, that guilt and condemnation and God doesn't love me. That's all from the pit of hell. The grace of God is sufficient for us for his strength is made perfect in weakness. So when we are weak, then Christ is strong in us. So we need to persevere. Let's run this race, church. I encourage you, if you feel tired and fatigued, and we're going to pray that God will give you energy by the Holy Spirit, but also that you will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the second most important thing after salvation. You need power. You can't make it on your own. Power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has filled your life or has come upon you. The opposite is true. You don't have any power if the Holy Spirit doesn't come upon you and fill you. That doesn't mean you're not a Christian. That doesn't mean that you're not saved. You're lacking the power of the Holy Spirit so that when Satan comes and attacks, we're able to resist and we're standing upon the Word of God, speaking the Word of God. You know, Christ never intended for his church to be powerless. He always intended for his church to be powerful to overcome Satan and sin and the world and temptation. But without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're lacking the power. You're lacking the energy. You're lacking the dunamis that comes from God. And then that uh, precious gift of speaking in unknown tongues that you edify yourself and you get stronger and stronger. Every time, you know, I'm feeling weak, I just start speaking in tongues and I feel this edification inside of me and the friends of God all over me. You know, sometimes when I'm praying, I, I feel like the anointing all over my body and my body feels like shaking because there's power in the things of Christ. Christ did not leave a powerless church. That's the church of men that are compromising, selling out, 
allowing anything to go on. The church of Jesus Christ is the church of power. But we need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to be in prayer. We need to fast. We need to be in that word. And I desire for everyone that has listened to me to fulfill the call of God in your life. Notice how that verse says that we will run the race with perseverance. That run that has been marked out for us. Who marked out that race? God marked out that race for us. So another point, I didn't add it, but another point is you need to run your own race that God has marked out for you. Everyone has their own calling, their own purpose, their own assignment from God. And you need to run the race that God has marked out for you because some people are trying to run somebody else's race. You need to run the race that God has marked out for you, the, the purposes of God in your life, the assignment that he has given you. We don't all have the same assignment, you know. In one sense, we do, which is to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. But how do we accomplish that is different for everybody, depending upon your calling, you know, where you work at, the people that God surrounded you with, your community, all that, you know, is different. But everyone has to run their own race. I can't run it for you. You can't run it for me. Sometimes I wish I could run the race for other people. And sometimes I wish I can lay back and somebody else run for me. I wait for you right here. But that's not the way it works. Everyone has to run the race that has been marked out for them. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to be accountable to God. So when God holds me accountable, he's not going to say, Peter, Karen, come up with your wife, Jennifer, come up and the kids. I'm going to be standing alone before God. I'm responsible before God on my own. I have to give an account to God whether I fulfill my assignment here on earth. Everyone is responsible because sometimes people blame it on their spouse or on their children or this happened or all these different excuses. The race that has been marked out for us. So I want to leave you with that and let us run the race with perseverance, keeping our eyes on Jesus, laying aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, so many saints have gone before us and have crossed the finish line. And now they're in heaven cheering us on. We can make it as well. So I'm going to leave it at that. And then we're going to pray that God would energize you, would encourage you, and would strengthen you.